All right. I believe I'm live. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. Don't put anything on your skin that you're not willing to eat. That's what we're going to talk about today at our week three live Q&A Wednesday. I'm Darcy. I'm the creator of the Vibrant Woman program, which is based on the math method. Phil Maffetone was my um, coach and mentor. He is uh, the founder of the math method. I'm one of the founding members of certified math method health and fitness coaches and practitioners. This is really important paradigm shifting work that is based on creating health in the human body in really natural ways. And I actually want to reframe that. It's not about creating health. It's about removing the obstacles. Lots of what we do in the modern world are our lifestyles and our diet are so far removed from the way humans evolved to be that we're actually creating disease and illness and we need to stop doing it. And I'm here to make sure that you have the, the power, the knowledge to know how to begin doing that. So I'm delighted you're here with me. Thank you for being here. It's a, a beautiful day where I am and we're gonna talk about safe and sane sun exposure. So I hope you are ready. I made some notes today. This is a really uh, deep topic. There's a lot here. And I think for the benefit of our, you know, our short Q&A sessions, what I want to do is keep it simple. I'm going to give you just a little bit of the background and philosophy about uh, why natural sun exposure is actually critical to your well-being and the health of your body. And um, a little philosophy there, and then I'll break it down into some very specific um, what to do's. This is the topic today for our Q&A because it's a question I hear a lot, especially this time of year. The Northern Hemisphere, we are in summer. I know it's not the summer solstice yet, but we have had summer temperatures. Um, that sun is out there blazing. The pools are open now where I live. So we need to talk about sunscreen use. We need to talk about um, what really is healthy for your skin and what the sun has to do with other things going on in your body, what you need to know about that. All right, so I'm going to dive right in. I did make some notes because I get a lot of this uh, variations on this question. Um, and let me just say this as well. Folks in my private coaching practice, they get all of this. We go much deeper one-on-one -on -one, and they get this all personalized because I want to say this up front, you'll hear me say it again, there really is no one size fits all. Um, we're going to talk about my recommendations in a minute. But the idea here is that we all have, you know, a combination of different sort of uh, genetic and lifestyle factors that are going to contribute to, to our overall health and fitness and well-being, okay, to our risk for disease, what disease. And yeah, so this is a loaded topic. The folks in my private practice, we obviously go one on one, way deeper. They get a lot of personalized recommendations and the hand holding they need to really make sure they're making the right decision for them. For today, I want to make sure you have some background. So I'm going to go ahead and jump right in here. Um, <laughs> so, no, Dr. Maffetone was not joking when he would say to me and to everyone he knew do not put anything on your skin that you're not willing to eat. And here's why. Our skin is one of the largest organs of the body. It's one of the, it's, it probably is the largest organ of elimination in the body. Um, and it's also, it's, you know, meant to be a barrier between the cells of our body and the cells uh, circulating in the outside world. So in that way, our skin is our first line of defense. It's also extremely bioactive, right? So whatever we put on our skin is brought into the body, slightly different pathway, but just like we eat things and bring them into our body to make them available to be distributed um, through the bloodstream to all the cells of the body, the exact same thing happens through your skin. So whatever you put on your skin is gonna be absorbed into the bloodstream and delivered to the cells of the body, including your gut, including your brain, including uh, your bones, your tissues, all of it. So we really do need to be more intentional about what we put on our skin. And I'll tell you this, we are up against a big one here, especially as women. We are marketed to more than any other demographic for beauty products. 
Um, beauty has a lot more to do with the way we're recreating cells from the inside out, less to do with what we put on our skin. But the point is we're targeted. There's a multi-billion dollar industry around skincare products and sunscreen is simply one of them. So we do have our work cut out for us if we're talking about a paradigm shift and changing the way people understand this, uh, but I'm gonna do my best today. So here's what I want you to consider. Anything you put on your skin ends up inside your body. Um, so your, your body has to choose to do one of two things with it. It either has to identify it as a potential building block and then take that thing where it can be used to build your body, or it has to be identified as an outside toxin and then it has to be eliminated um, via those pathways. So either way, your body has to make a choice. And I recommend you only put things on your skin that your body can use, okay? One of the things I want you to remember is that human beings evolved on this planet in the presence of natural sunlight. In fact, the sun interacts with our bodies in so many various ways that are crucial to our health, even to our survival. So here's a short list. Just think about this for a minute. The sunlight comes in through our retina in our eye and reaches the brain, helping to regulate the production of melatonin and basically govern our diurnal rhythm. Okay, so that's a really important signal that we get through our body to help us know, um, you know, when to wake, when to sleep, and all of the chemical um, products that happen to make, to give us our energy, to create a, a, a sleepy brain so that we can shut down and regenerate. We depend on sunlight to do this. It increases our endorphin production. It lowers stress hormones. I'm talking about activation of sunlight to the body. It facilitates, sunlight facilitates calcium absorption to both the body and the brain. Now I think you're gonna say, oh yeah, calcium is important for my bones. So yes, sunlight is important for your bones. Calcium's other, has many roles, obviously. One of the lesser known roles for calcium is in the brain, it has neurological impacts. Um, and this is especially important for people like my daughter who was at risk for seizures. Um, she had a brain injury. And making sure that you get proper calcium regulation and delivery to all of the cells, that's one of the roles of sunlight. Calcium in your brain um, helps with your memory. It's a, like a calming, um, has a calming effect on the brain, which also is important for children with learning disabilities and hyperactivity. So again, all of that can only happen in the presence of proper sunlight, okay? Sunlight reduces your risk of heart disease, hypertension, and stroke. It impacts your carbohydrate tolerance or intolerance. So yes, getting adequate sunlight on your skin helps you to be able to digest and process and use carbs more efficiently, making us less carb intolerant, meaning we're not likely to be insulin resistant, we're at less risk for developing diabetes. Um, vitamin D is produced through um, the interaction of sunlight on our skin. That's a complicated process, but what I want you to know is that we are in the midst of a global vitamin D deficiency. This is well-documented. Billions of people on the planet today are dangerously low in their vitamin D. Um, this is especially important because a lot of the research around vitamin D is done by white professionals on white bodies. We know that people like me, uh, considered white, with lighter skin, um, my ancestors, as they moved farther away from the equator and eventually evolved this lighter skin, they also evolved lower needs for vitamin D, lower needs for sun stimulation to their skin. But if you are a person of the global majority, if you have the original human skin tone, then you probably have much higher vitamin D needs than even the um, current research is showing because a lot of that research is done on white bodies. So there's a lot here. That is only one of the many factors that put people of color at higher risk for other diseases because vitamin D is implicated in our immunity. Here's what else we need vitamin D for. Our brain function, our hormone balance, our physical healing, and yes, our bone density. The list goes on. So you can take a pill, and actually I recommend everybody get their hands on some all natural vitamin D3. That's the bioavailable form that can be used. 
Um, that's what happens when the sunlight um, converts vitamin D into its available bioavailable form on our skin. Um, but a pill will never come close to producing the same beneficial effects as just what nature intended, which is for us to have some bare skin out under the sun every day. Now, before you, uh, you know, panic and run off, we have been programmed to be afraid of sun. And it, ha it has to do with the C word, right? And I'm not here to um, shame or blame anybody for their own emotional reaction to that. But I want us to consider the agenda. And I want us to use our critical thinking skills to just compare. In the last 40 years, we have seen rates of not only skin cancer, but all other cancers increase exponentially. This is the same era in which we have seen chemicals in our environment increase exponentially. One major source of those chemicals is skincare products. And when you look at the pie graph of how, you know, whether it's toner or moisturizer, what it, sunscreen is a huge piece of that pie. Most commercial sunscreens today contain at least four toxic chemicals in them. They contain other things like endocrine disruptors, xenoestrogens. These are compounds that get into the body, cannot be eliminated easily, and they affect our hormone balance. This affects both men and women. It's especially detrimental to women, particularly women in two, um, well, across the lifespan, but two um, groups of women at higher risk for, for really seeing um, big symptoms from this. One is women coming into menses, so young women, and women exiting their menstrual years, going moving into menopause. Um, so at those times of hormone transition, you are the most vulnerable to um, hormone imbalance from chemical products that we bring in through the skin. All right, so I want you to just take a deep breath for a minute and just digest what I'm talking about. I want you to begin to lean in with me to a potentially new paradigm, one where we recognize that we do not have to be afraid of nature, that we actually co-evolved on this planet in partnership with nature, human beings evolved under the sun. What we do need to be careful of is overexposure to the sun, and we definitely need to be careful of overexposure to the sun in combination with so many other unhealthy lifestyle habits that put us at risk for disease. Okay. So this is the, like the cross section um, of danger. All right. So <clears throat> there's a common sense way to, uh, to get through this. Um, let me just check my notes because I want to make sure I'm giving you everything that I, um, that I plan to. And I could talk for days about this topic. And again, in my private coaching practice, we spend as much time here as everybody needs to make sure that they're individualizing these recommendations, that you have other resources to learn about. And in fact, I'll put a couple links below. I'll tell you in a minute um, what resources I want you to have and what other further research I definitely recommend that you do. Okay, so the main idea here is that some sun exposure is important. I'll tell you what I learned too from Dr. Maffetone and so many others that are really on the leading edges here of health and fitness and well being, evolutionary medicine. Um, what we need to know is that the body does have a program for this, okay? A good natural tan is your best defense against damage from the sun's rays, all right? So allowing yourself to develop a healthy natural tan without burning. And we'll come around to the how to control the burning in just a minute. What this means is that we can't just stay inside and then um, for some months of the year, either on a vacation or in the summer, go outside mostly naked and get um, an abundance of exposure from the sun. That's an unhealthy habit. What we really need to do is to reframe this and say, well, if all of those um, impacts of sunlight on our skin, we need to be healthy all year round. We need vitamin D all year round. We need healthy brains and bones and immunity and hormone balance all year round. We should be getting some moderate sun exposure all year round. 
Okay, so that's really important that we do that. Some moderate sun exposure without the risk of burning. Sun exposure by itself does not increase your risk for melanoma. Sunburn does. So what we need to do is try to make sure that we develop a safe, healthy tan. That's our first line of defense against um, the C word. Um, and we do that by getting exposure outdoors a little bit every day all, all year round. And what you notice, I'm beginning to develop my tan at this time of year. I can spend more and more time outside in the direct sunlight as my skin naturally darkens, right? But we have to be careful not to burn. Okay, the other best friend that you have in terms of defending your skin against damage from the sun is a healthy layer of fat. Now, we're gonna, we can do this in two ways. I do it in two ways, and here's what I recommend. That you eat proper, healthy fats in your diet. That helps you create a nice, healthy layer of fat um, under your, your skin, and it protects the sun's dangerous radiation from penetrating into deeper layers of the dermis where it can do potentially long-term damage, okay? So eating healthy fats is definitely an important part of this. The other thing you can do is to apply fat to your skin. So the old-fashioned days, so the unhealthy ways that we did it when I was a teenager, we'd slather ourselves with baby oil. We learned this from our mothers and her generation and laid out in the, the noonday sun, in the baking sun to get a quick tan. Well, there's something off there, right? So that long times of exposure in the middle of the day, the harshest amount of sunlight, that's putting us at risk for a sunburn. But there was something important that they knew there about the layer of fat on top of your skin. It needs to be a healthy fat. Remember, it's absorbed through your skin into the bloodstream. But something like a pure shea butter or a pure cocoa butter, that layer of skin of fat on the outside of your skin does a couple of things. Um, number one, it stops some of the more dangerous rays from penetrating deeper into your skin where it can cause damage. It also keeps your skin moisturized and moist skin, healthy skin that is holding on to its moisture and its fat content is definitely easier to tan and less likely to burn. So taking care of your skin by applying these all natural fats to your skin, and that could be definitely before you go out into the sun while you're going to be exposed, but also um, as part of your self-care and bathing routine, I recommend using these all natural fats like shea butter or cocoa butter. There are a few others. Um, eating your healthy fats is important. The other things that you eat or don't eat are also important. So on the surface, I, I get it. You can roll your eyes at me and say, Darcy, how does eating McDonald's for lunch or breakfast every day have anything to do with my risk of skin cancer? Well, a lot of you out there are eating McDonald's for lunch or, or uh, breakfast every day and thinking you're gonna save yourself the cancer by slathering on the sunscreen. Those are actually two high risk activities that put you in the high risk for skin cancer group. That inflammatory diet, cancer is an inflammatory disease. Having an inflammatory diet, the standard American diet, the Western diet is inflammatory. It puts you at high risk for inflammatory disease like cancer. So what we need to do is to get that diet under control. We need to get you eating real food, which would include healthy fats, high quality protein, all of the anti-inflammatory uh, foods, these are the rainbow-colored, low-starch, natural vegetables. Some fruits, too. You need to lean more toward the vegetables. As many servings as you can, as many different colors, the better. And they need to be grown in nutrient-rich soil. These are the things that go into your body that help you create a healthy body that is able to find cells that are not copying correctly, right? So this is very layered, but when cancer starts, that first little um, mutation is not necessarily the problem if the body's cells can find and fix it quickly enough. You need the foundation of a healthy body to be able to lower your risk for that. So I just wanted to put all of this into context. We tend to think so symptomatically in our culture. Like there's one um, thing that's a possible problem, and so that's a symptom, and we're gonna target it with one pill. So we're scared of skin cancer, we're slathering ourselves with, with sunscreen, and a lot of that is actually toxic. If you've heard me say it once, 
say it again, don't put dangerous chemicals on your skin, hoping to prevent something else. You're causing something else. Here's the other thing that most of the commercial sunscreens do. They block all radiation from the sun. They're blocking your ability to create vitamin D. So we have vitamin D as a very important foundational piece of our immune system. Low vitamin D levels are known to be correlated with high cancer rates and high risk for cancer. So we're blocking our vitamin D, which would protect us from cancer, with sunscreen that we think is protecting us from cancer. So we've just got to think more logically about this. We've got to get back to more natural roots. Here is what I recommend. Along with that healthy diet and good sleep and natural movement, which you'll hear me talk about more and more. Again, my private clients get all the details for this for themselves personally. There's no one size fits all here. Those are the foundations of a healthy body. I want you to consider your risk for burning in the sun. All right. So I definitely want you to prevent a burn. Here's some of the, if without the chemicals in the toxic sunscreen, there's plenty of other ways to do that. So light layers of clothing. Many of us have already gone that direction. If you're going to be exposed um, at a time that makes you at risk for burning, then you need to have light layers to cover up. So that might be a wide brimmed hat for your face. That's definitely what I've been wearing when I go to the pool lately. You know, my shoulders and skin and legs and back. Um, they they turn, they tan very easily. I don't burn there. Where I might burn, I protect with a sun hat, with long sleeves if you need to. But I don't want you to feel that you have to cover up from all of the sun's um, impact on your skin. Just the times that you're at risk for burning. Definitely prevent a burn. Okay. The other thing that we can do is to use all natural sunscreens. Luckily, there is an industry that's trying to come in and get a piece of the market, and they are doing us a favor because they're making products without the endocrine disruptors, without the xenoestrogenic compounds, um, without the carcinogenic chemicals, without all the toxic stuff. They're based on, um, they probably have things like shea butter and cocoa butter as a base, and they probably use some other natural mineral compounds like zinc oxide, and they've even got some that rub in now that, you know, you don't have to have um, the white nose if you don't want it. Some other really high quality, all natural skin products that are not toxic. In the links below, I'm going to put um, the Environmental Working Group's website. If you're not already familiar with them, I want you to go over there and take a look. They put out really good information about the toxicity of all kinds of things, foods, but definitely our skincare products. And I want you to check there before you continue using this stuff on your skin. You need to go and find out what's in it and if that's good for you or not. Um, again, look at that list of ingredients on the label and ask yourself if you would eat that. Now, shea butter wouldn't taste all that great, but it actually is a little sweet. <laughs> and uh, you get my point. If it's not something you're willing to eat, then you need to think twice about slathering it all over um, the cells of your skin on your body. Okay? I'm going to take a deep breath for a minute and just look to see if there are any other questions around what I am talking about here. It flies in the face of some of the mainstream advice. I get that. There's a lot going on in mainstream advice that is fear-based and that is not accurately connecting cause and effect and that is ignoring the fact that we evolved in nature. We have forgotten that we are not like nature. We are nature. And the health of your body depends on you returning to that as much as possible. Okay, so a couple of deep breaths. Um, yeah, I think I've pretty much covered that topic. If there are any questions around what I've said, I'm happy to go deeper to answer. Okay, main takeaway. Use all natural skincare products eat a natural diet, get your rest, eat as many vegetables as possible, do what you can to create a body that thrives and that can protect itself, okay? Don't get a sunburn. Go outside a little bit every day. Allow parts of your body to be exposed that are not at risk for burning. This will help to stimulate all of those um, processes that only can happen in the presence of sunlight that, again, help to create a naturally vibrant, healthy body. 
Okay. If there aren't any other questions or comments on that, I'm going to move on. I did get one other question this week that I think is really important. Um, it's very related to this, but uh, it's going to go a slightly different direction. This is another question I get a lot. And so I, this is one I picked this week. I hear you talking, Darcy, I hear you talking about carb restriction. But athletes need carbs, don't they? Carb loading is the way to prepare your body for athletic for athletic events like races, etc. Okay, I have a lot to say about this. I'm going to keep it uh, on the lean side today because many of you have heard me talk about carbohydrate carbohydrate restriction in the context of a two week carbohydrate test. That is one of the only ways I know to find out what your personal carbohydrate tolerance is, and that is the foundation for all other aspects of health. Because if you're eating above your carb tolerance, you become insulin resistant. Um, that is the precursor for all metabolic disease. We don't want to do that, okay? We need to get back to our, again, our nature, the way nature made us. Humans were not evolved to eat highly processed foods full of sugar, refined sugar. Um, so we have to find out how carbohydrate tolerant each of us is individually. So that is a period of carbohydrate restriction, all right? So let me just frame that. I'm not saying carbohydrate restriction for everyone all the time. I'm saying find out. If you want more help with that, again, that's something that I go way deep, one-on-one -on -one with people um, in my private coaching practice. And I actually have some small mini coaching packages up available right now, just through the end of the summer, um, to just do the carb test part if people want some hand-holding with that. So I'll put my website link below as well. Go check that out if that's something you are wanting to know more about but not sure how to tackle that by yourself. I've got you. Okay, now here's the thing about athletes and carbohydrates. The healthiest metabolism for humans, our natural metabolism, is a fat-burning metabolism, okay? That's why keto has become so popular. A lot of people are seeing a lot of success transitioning back to a fat burning metabolism. Now there are fast and slow ways to do that. Again, it's not one size fits all. Um, but here's the main idea. Carb loading is a bit of a myth and it's only necessary for athletes whose bodies are carb dependent. So if you have done the work, you've ch you know your carbohydrate tolerance, Okay, that's the diet part of this, and you eat beneath your carbohydrate tolerance and you're eating enough fat and protein. And if you have done the fitness part of this, which is to train your body to work out in a fat burning window, and that has everything to do with intensity, it has everything to do with what heart rate you're working out at. Higher heart rates tend to be more sugar burning, that's, ana that's an anaerobic state. Um, Lower heart rates tend to be fat burning. That's an aerobic state, develops your aerobic system. The MAF method on which my Vibrant Woman program is based is all about establishing a really solid aerobic base before we move into any anaerobic work. There's a place for both of them. What happens when we race as athletes is we tend to just throw all of that to the wind. We wanna go as fast as we can. And that typically will put us into an anaerobic state. It's usually fine because this is all about balance, um, balance over, over time within each workout and balance of the number of anaerobic versus aerobic workouts we do over, let's say, a week or a month, and then we look at phases during the year. So I'm not saying it's a problem to race anaerobically. What I am saying is that for athletes who have done both parts of this, the nutrition part, knowing what your carbohydrate tolerance is and being compliant with it, and working with your own intensity, monitoring your heart rate, noticing the physiological signs of, of that, and getting into a fat burning metabolism, then you can adapt your body to using fat for fuel for most of your racing. So it's not necessary to carb load. It's only necessary to make sure that you have a fat burning metabolism that will then burn fat, and to make sure that we're eating properly so that, you know, even the leanest of bodies has plenty of fat to burn. Um, but we want to make sure that, see, what we do when we carb load then is we're forcing, um, 
yeah, we're forcing some processes on the cells that aren't natural, that actually lean us toward a disease state. It forces a bunch of storage. That's what people are saying. Those excess carbs will be stored in your muscles and in your liver as glycogen. And then in the middle of that race, when you're at that anaerobic heart rate level and you're burning sugars and you don't have any sugar to eat, your body will tap into those glycogen stores, convert them back into glucose and make them available. But that's really bulky and it's a lot of energy and it leans us toward inflammatory stuff. So here's my recommendation. Do the slow work first. Help your body transition into a fat burning metabolism and then give it a try and see how you do. You may still find that for some, you know, really high, mm, like intense races, if you're going to go fully anaerobic, depending on where on this journey into fat burning metabolism you are, yes, you may still require um, some carb loading. But typically, that is exactly the diet and the lifestyle that this program and what it's based on, the math method, is trying to take people away from. Because that carb loading for an athlete might look like glycogen stores that can be used during an intense race. But that very same diet is what's being promoted by the mainstream, by billion dollar corporations in the form of boxed and bagged food. That very same diet is the cause of diabetes in those of us sitting around on our sofas watching TV day in and day out. Okay? So carb loading is never good for you. It's a matter of what your body is adapted to do and kind of what you're asking it to do. And I absolutely recommend that you do the work, the slow work of building a solid aerobic foundation. Getting into a fat burning metabolism has so many more implications, not just in your athletic ability. It has everything to do with your neurology, with your brain, with the way that you age. Um, it's, it's a very important um, distinction to make in the ways that it impacts your health. So yeah, I hope that was helpful for some people too. And if that opened up other curiosities and questions, you know what to do. You can put your questions below and I'll scan through them. You can also send questions for next time to connect at darcyhawkshurst.com. I do give priority to the questions that are coming in through email. Um, and I would love to see your questions there. If there are any questions here by live folks with me, I'm going to just pause for a minute. If you have questions, you have a couple minutes here to type them in. And I want to thank you for being here with me. I want to ask you to do two things. Um, if you don't already follow me, I'm going to invite you to do that. And I also want to invite you to hop over to my website and sign up for my free weekly e-newsletter. You're going to find all kinds of value there. Um, we talk about eating well. I'm always saying eat your healthy fats. What are they? Well, you're going to get recipes for what I'm calling the healthy fats and how to eat them and what they are and how to know. You get all of that in that free weekly e-newsletter. Um, you're also going to get great stories. Um, the story of my daughter's brain injury, how she overcame it to become an independent, successful college student. That's the root of all of this learning for me. And it's amazing what we can do when we really tap into the body's own power to heal and to thrive. You know, and a lot of what I teach is just removing the obstacles to that. So anyway, come get on the newsletter list and I'll see you in your inbox and I will see you next week on Wednesday, same time and place. Take really good care, beloveds.